Let's see how this going. Okay, cool. All right. So good evening, everybody. My name is Stuart Halloway. How many people here are local to Austin? So what, a third maybe? A little bit more than a third? How many people are just in for a closure conch? How many people are here for the food and are like super disappointed that they have to wait? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have good food at the end. So I'm going to talk about closure spec. Some of you may have seen the talk on this that I did at Strange Loop. Um, it's going to bear a, an astonishing resemblance to that talk at the slide level. Uh, but uh, happily, there's about 100 times more to say than could be said uh, in the time frame that we had at Strange Loop. So I've given a talk from these slides. I gave a talk, uh, a virtual talk to the Portland uh, Closure Users Group, and that was twice as long, and same slides, and they seemed to really like it and think that it was different. So this will I'll be different again. Basically, I, I just say a completely different set of things about spec uh, every time I'm asked, and we'll see how long it takes before I you know, loop around. So I'm going to talk about uh, why closure spec, so why should you care, and then we'll talk about how to make specs, and then talk separately about leveraging specs. And just the fact that we're, I mean, separating out that first thing is kind of a classic hint that you're in a closure environment, right? You have to start with a rationale. You can't, you can't just sit down and start doing anything, or Rich will pop out of a box and slap your hand. Uh, and, then the separation of these second two points is kind of important as well, and it sort of gets to the foundation of what spec is about, which is that um, you sort of devise your specs orthogonally from how you deploy them and use them. So they are a, a set of information that exists sort of regardless of whether you in fact choose to leverage them. So what I want from programs, well there's a lot of things, uh, but people like things in threes, so here's three. Uh, I'd like for programs to be correct, which is to say free from error. And uh, if you've built software, you know that this is quite a subtle proposition and that type systems may help and tests may help and code review may help, but there's no sort of one-stop magic fairy dust that makes programs error-free. Um, I'd also like to be agile. And this word has gotten sort of probably overused. And so I'd like to bring it back to its original colloquial English definition. I'd like to be able to move quickly and easily. And in particular, I'd like to build systems with a fairly small elephant in the room. Uh, and the elephant that I'm talking about is the code that you wrote yesterday and the code that you wrote two months ago and six months ago. Uh, having been in the Clojure ecosystem now for eight years, I've been living with code that I wrote for that long. And I intend to live with that code for at least 15 more years before I maybe start to get a little bit lazy. And uh, and I want to be able to write programs that are not dominated by being painted into uh, decisions that I made six months ago or five years ago. And my experience has been, through most of my programming career, that it takes approximately 10 minutes after you start a Greenfield project before you start to be painted in uh, <laughs> by your decisions. And so I want to avoid that. Uh, and finally, I'd like to have uh, my programs be robust. I'd like to be able to... Uh, uh, understand, and it's really not about being bug free, although that's great, you know, correct is good, but it's really about being able to understand what's going on when things are not great and being able to uh, have evidence for what problems are and be able to say, oh, okay, you know, we had this problem, now we can track that down and get rid of it. Because I assure you that we're going to be approximately as dumb tomorrow as we are today, uh, which means that we're going to make bugs at approximately the same rate. Um, and we're going to make maybe incremental improvements there. And those improvements are going to be totally dominated by what stakeholders ask us to do. Right? So if we get 20% better at making bug-free code, we're going to get asked to do 300% more stuff. Uh, the net result of which is we're going to have more bugs. So I'd like to have systems that are bug-free, but in addition, when and inevitably they're not, I'd like to be able to understand what's going wrong. I'd also like to be able to understand what's going wrong when something adverse happens, and that's not just you know, self-inflicted things, that's somebody kicks the power cord out, um, you know, the system that's responsible for storage, the hard drive dies, all those kinds of things. So, how are we going to get these things? Well, traditionally, uh, we've been told, we were told for a long time, and I'm going to now say that I've been doing this for a long time. I'm not actually that old, most of my gray hair was caused by my kids, but I have been writing software for a while, and, uh, you know, early in my career, I was sort of told, you know, you need types to help you not make mistakes. And this wasn't the awesome Haskell type system. This was even just like C and then C++ and, and things like that. 
you know, as a sort of set of guardrails to keep you from making mistakes. Uh, then we went through a brief phase. Some of you may have read, uh, read the book Code Complete that talks about doing things like stepping through every code path in a debugger and watching all the registers and making sure that everything seems to be going uh, the way that you want to. And that was what we did before we had unit testing, right? We, we, we did unit testing, uh, but the, the thing doing the unit testing wasn't the computer, it was the human uh, sitting at the computer. And then we got unit tests. Uh, unit tests as a name really took off, which is unfortunate because the technology that gets used to do unit tests is used to test at all kinds of scales and scopes. And a much better name for them is example tests, um, which I coined and I get a nickel every time you say it. So uh, if you could please start saying example-based tests. Um, and the idea of an example-based test is you automate an example usage of something. And obviously that could be at the unit level, right? I'm going to use this function and see if it works or use this object and see if it works. But it could also be you know, an end-to-end -end smoke test or an elaborate acceptance test. But the thing that these tests have in common is that there's a human crafting examples. Right? You're sitting there going, well, here's a scenario. I'll try that. Here's another scenario. And you're committing it to automation. I want to be agile. Well, the tools that we use for agile, I remember the sort of big breakthrough in this space was when we got the first refactoring IDEs. Right? You could take a, a program and say, you know, <laughs> I made a bad choice. I really wish this name was that name. But I know that's going to touch 70 files. And I know, no matter how good I am with grep or whatever, that if I try to do it myself, I'm inevitably going to, you know, if there's 70, how many of them am I going to find? 68. 68, 69. And the other one is going to come up when the boss is watching. Right? So I know how this is going to work. Uh, so these tools are really cool. Um, another tool that really helps agility is uh, local concision. And so concision just means being short. And, and local concision is sort of being short and scoped. And for me, I got a lot of uh, experience with this with Ruby where I had been doing Java development for a long time. And when I started writing code in Ruby, I was able to write things that were small enough that I could reason about them because they fit on the screen. And there's a big, and, and that's not just about shrinking the font. You could do that too. But, uh, but there's, there's a big you know, uh, aspect of that that really matters. Uh, also, you know, the idea of encapsulation helps us be more agile because it helps us be walled off from details that we don't care about. So, you know, the thing that sucks about writing code is when you're working over here and you do something and over here something falls over and you know you caused it and you don't even understand why those two things are connected together. And so encapsulation, encapsulation is really the only good part of OO. So, but it's a super important thing, right? It's a super important idea. Um, and then, you know, we don't really know how to make systems robust yet, so I'm going to leave that um, space blank for the moment. Now, Clojure adds some ideas to this mix. If you want to write correct programs in Clojure, there's a story that's about using 99% you know, uh, pure functional idioms and about using Clojure state model. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about this stuff tonight. This is sort of basic Clojure stuff. But if you're coming here and you're not super familiar with Clojure, this is important. right? By itself, you know, these ideas, which I'm not going to talk much about, are important. Uh, in terms of agility, uh, nothing helps you more than simplicity. And uh, I will t say a little bit about this, although how many people have seen Rich's talk about simplicity or, or you know, something like it? I mean, this is the most important single thing to sort of understanding what's going on uh, in a, an experienced closure programmer's head. But the idea is that you tease apart concepts. And so you say, you, you stare at something and you go, you know, look, that looks like one thing. But the more I look at it, the more I see that it's really two things. And as soon as you see that it's two, two things, you refactor, you break it apart, and you deliver those two things independently. And the thing that happens when you do that is that you get more and more Lego-like building blocks. And they get smaller and smaller, and you're more and more able to, to make exactly what you want. And when you make exactly what you want, you're not carrying around things you didn't want that are going to end up biting you or end up making it difficult for you to change the program in the future. So that's very important, and it is not easily done. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of the things that are in closure that you know you can explain in five minutes, and you can see the elegant simplicity of it when you have it explained to you. You know, took decades of thinking and experience. You know, looking at different things, saying, "Well, can we really simplify that a little bit more?" Uh, the other idea, and I'm going to talk more about this in a minute, is uh, systemic generality. And so the idea of systemic generality, and this is a phrase that um, really grew out in the last year of of trying to think about what it is that 
you know, really separates closure both from expressive scripting languages like you know, Ruby or Python and things like that, uh, and also from uh, you know, powerful statically typed languages, things like Haskell and F-sharp. And, and what it is, is this notion that we're going to have a set of general purpose data fun uh, structures and functions, this small set of functions. Um, and we're going to use that, and we're not going to make new stuff. Right? We're going to make do with that. And this is incredibly powerful, not just because of the gen generality of it. Right? If you've looked at Clojure's core library, there's you know, what, maybe 100 functions in core, maybe 120 that manipulate maps and lists and sets uh, and things like that. And every once in a while, you come up with a new one, like transduce. Uh, but the number of those, right, the number of those is so small that when a new one comes up, like transduce, it's like a whole, you know, <laughs> major release worthy event, right? Just having a, a few new uh, tools uh, in your toolbox. And the power really comes from then saying, we're going to use that everywhere. So it's not just about your program, it's also about configuration, it's also about data on the wire, it's also about data at rest. You can use this systemically, and you've seen that evolve in Clojure over the years as we sort of pulled out from Clojure syntax the Eden specification that talks about using these same data structures to talk about data in the absence of a program. Uh, you see it again with Freshen, which is like binary Eden. You see it again with Transit, which is like Eden that can steal performance from uh, JavaScript engines. Right? That's really what Transit is. But all these ideas are about taking the same idea and making it systemic. And what happens when you do that is you avoid death by specificity. And so this is an enterprise Java Beans best practices <laughs> picture from Oracle. It doesn't really matter the specific details other than that they are specific. Right? That you actually make code that's called category bean. And you make code that's called order detail. And you write classes. And this turns out to be true. It's not really about static versus dynamic typing. right? You would do the same thing in Ruby. If you're modeling something in Ruby, you would say, I'm going to make an order class and an order line item class, and so on. And I'd use Active Record to map that to my database or whatever. <coughs> um, and the thing about this is that not only do you have this for your domain, but you have it everywhere else, too. Right? Property files in Java are really just information, but they have their own API. JSON is really just information, but it has its own API. Um, the servlet API is just about information going back and forth on the web, but it has its own API. In fact, and this is one of the ones that Rich likes to point at, servlet has three ad hoc implementations of key value lookup, just buried in various interfaces in servlet, none of which actually are just java.util.map, which already knows how to do key value lookup. And so what's happening here is that you're solving the same pro problems over and over again. And what happens when you solve the same problem 12 times and give it different names? Is that a good thing? Yeah. <laughs> it could be. It could be a good thing if the, if, the, if the actual solutions are different enough. But these are not actually typically things that are, that are valuably different. They are sort of arbitrarily different. And you also end up with sort of impoverished implementations. So one of those 12 things got really carefully tested and whatever, but which one is it? And, and you, know, you end up using the wrong one. So well, what does Clojure say about this? There should be a little song. <laughs> map, 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 right? Everything maps. And this matters because people tend to lump Clojure with dynamic languages against static languages. And that's actually a mistake, right? Most dynamic and static languages do what I'm going to call encapsulated specificity. Right? You make specific new types that represent nouns in your system. Right? This is equally true in Java and Python and Ruby and C Sharp and Scala to some degree. Right? That's encapsulated specificity. And then that encapsulation, right? in this case, this encapsulation is protecting information from algorithms. I'm going to say that again slowly. <laughs> right? Encapsulated specificity protects information from algorithms. I don't, I don't really want that. <laughs> right? That's not a desirable thing. I'd like for algorithms to be able to use my information. And so, and, and you know, there, there are important differences between, say, a C sharp mindset and a Ruby mindset. Right? If you're an enterprise object oriented programmer, you believe in the type systems as an important you know, means of quality. If you come from that agile sort of scripting language background, you believe in automated testing uh, as a path to quality. And these are not absolutes. Obviously, there's degrees 
and so forth, but you know, just to paint in, in a broad brush. Uh, enclosure is really in its own category, which I don't have a paradigm name for. Um, I think we should make one up, but I'm not good at naming, so I'll let somebody else take a crack at it. But this idea of systemic generality, and then when you do that, the thing that a closure programmer would point to uh, to say what is going to be the biggest help in making your program correct is actually being functional. Right? It's programming functionally everywhere. And we believe it's an advantage not just to be functional, but to be functional and avoid it, all the type nonsense in type functional languages, which end up doing all this sort of specificity. Right, so that you have to write different algorithms to manipulate different types. So, well, that's pretty good. Right, that's a pretty good thing. So there's lots of, you know, here's a quote from uh, Adrian Cockroft uh, talking about, you know, wow, I know a ton of smart people. They all seem to be using Clojure and doing really great stuff. That's cool. <clears throat> it's good, but it could be better. And the problem is that there's an incredible leverage that you get from working with general purpose data structures. But the fact of it is, you do actually have specificity in your domain, right? You do actually have orders. You do actually have line items. You have accounts. You have robot arms. You have whatever it is that you have in your domain. And so what happens is that closure programmers go through this sort of three phases, or at least uh, I'm hoping to take you to phase three if you're not there already. Phase one is systemic generality is scary. Right? And this is the, the outsider perspective, like I'm looking at closure programs and there aren't any classes. Right? There's nothing that represents orders and line items and robot arms and whatever. And that seems kind of scary. And then somebody convinces you to try it and you start using it for a while and you're like, oh, okay, I can, sort of get, I can see how you get along with this. But then you still have trouble dealing with specificity. And so you're like, okay, I get that this is a huge win, but I see it as a trade-off. It's a trade-off that's on the side of winning, but it's still a trade-off because there are specific things in my system. And so you start trying to use you know, various kinds of things like uh, plumatic schema and things to talk about specificity in your system, because specificity matters. And what we want to do is get to a point where we have a way to talk about specificity in programs that is true to closure principles. And that's what we're here to talk about, right? Closure spec is how to deal with specificity in a closure way. It's expressive, it's powerful, it's integrated with the language, it helps you talk about information, and it also helps you test your systems. So what happens is that you can take an existing system and start writing specs that describe information in that system. And those specs, I mean, you could write them on paper. I and mean, I probably wouldn't do that, but you could. And those specs have value in and of themselves, regardless of whether they're ever executed. And I think you could, you could absolutely, if you think about other things we do to try to make sure our programs are correct, uh, that argument sort of makes sense. You can imagine it playing a game where it's like, okay, you're allowed to write unit tests, but you're not allowed to run them. Will that still help you make your program better? Yeah, it does, right? The exercise of, of doing that, thinking it through, there's value there. Likewise, imagine a typed language that actually never enforced the types, but they were there. Right? Those kinds of things you know, can still help you. And likewise with spec, which is more powerful than those things. Uh, it's powerful by itself, but then once you've built this, you can use it anywhere. And, and it's not a thing that sort of automatically flows throughout your system. You decide how much spec power you want to apply at a specific point in your system. And you might say, you know what, this thing over here is really sensitive and dangerous and scary and hard to explain to other people. So we're going to pour a lot of spec here. And this thing over here is none of those things, right? It's a throwaway thing. It's easy to understand just by looking at it. So you could spec it, but I'm not going to even bother. Or I'm going to write a, 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 a very you know, partial spec for that thing. And so you get a whole new set of powers that address all of the things we talked about uh, at the beginning. So when you have specs, you get uh, specs and predicates that describe your program and say whether or not you know, a particular piece of data conforms. And you can then run automated tests without writing tests. So when you write specs, you get automated tests for free. You have to choose to run them, but, but they're there uh, ambiently as a result of having written specs. You also get instrumentation. Instrumentation says, I'm going to put guards in at boundaries in the system, and those guards are going to enforce specs. And you can turn that on dynamically during development, and then when you're happy, you know, that's gone uh, in production time. In terms of agility, um, specs help document your system. 
for all the same reasons that types and tests help document your system, right? They provide something that you can look at that describes the pieces in your system. Um, they can also generate example data for you. So having written a spec for something, you can ask Clojure to make data that conforms to that spec. Which if you think about running those automated tests I talked about before, in order to have tests run without you coming up with examples, somebody else had better come up with examples. And it's Clojure that's going to do that for you. Um, and then uh, on the robustness side, uh, uh, spec provides uh, validation on an a la carte basis that you can use anywhere. Right, you know, right down in the middle of a function somewhere, you can just say, I want to validate this piece of data against this spec. So it's not tied to test time. It's not tied to compilation. It's not tied to methods boundaries. It's tied to whatever the heck you want to tie it to. So this pretty much uh, is more fun than using example tests or types to make your program uh, uh, reliable. And so if you, this is the, um, uh, so the color coding here, you know, green, good, yellow, question mark, uh, pinkish, red, not so good. It's actually redder here. It's just a projector thing. It's not supposed to be happy pink. <laughs> it's supposed to be sad pink. So, and I want to talk, we don't have to talk about all these rows, but we can just, you know, I'll let you look at it for a second. I'll rest my voice, and then we can talk, I'll talk about a couple of these, and then uh, take questions, uh, if people have questions about sort of how these different pieces fit together. So I'll point out a few. Um, specification. Example tests uh, are not specifications. They don't describe the shape of things. They don't describe predicates about things. They're the programs that run. Um, as a result, um, example tests are very expressive. Right? They're arbitrary programs. They, they, they're as expressive as you can figure out how to be in your programming language. But they don't act as specifications. Um, static, uh, type systems absolutely act as specifications. That's what they are. But they are a specification system with an important qualifying limitation, which is when do they get to do their stuff? Compile, Compile time. Right? And they can't run your program. Right? That's not part of the game. Right? They can figure out what can be figured out statically. Now, if you look at what static typing people are doing, it's stunning the kinds of things they can figure out statically. It's way more than you might think if you don't spend time <laughs> in that space. But it's still a limitation. Right? And processing time is cheap. <clears throat> I would be happy to run my programs, especially if I can have some, something that will run them for me um, to figure out what's happening. So uh, the other one I would want to point out is uh, that both testing and types are supposed to help agility and really, I think, fail to deliver. So automated testing helps you be agile because with your automated test suite in place, you can refactor with impunity. That's true to a degree, but it's quite expensive. How many people have spent a large amount of time um, gardening a test suite and keeping it healthy? Right? That is a very big cost of getting that agility. And it, it may be worth it, but it's pricey. Um, types, uh, in principle, would allow you to be really agile. And they certainly help you know, tools do things on your behalf. But in practice, I have seen types make systems ridiculously fragile way more often then they have made systems really easy to maintain. And so what happens is you make a change over here, and instead of breaking at runtime over there, it breaks at compile time over there, but it still breaks uh, like a chain of things, like of dominoes falling down throughout your system, and you have to go and, and fix it. Now, a, t a static typing advocate would say, well, you just didn't use types right. And I would say, I'm just basing this on watching hundreds and hundreds of people use types wrong. And, you know, Maybe we'll get better at it, but it's very challenging. Um, and in fact, this continues to be challenging with spec. People are going to make some of the same kinds of mistakes with spec. They're going to over-specify, right, just as you might with types, and they're going to make systems where the spec stops something from working because they turn it on you know, when, they, when they shouldn't. So there's, there's, those challenges are still there. But because it's dynamic and because you apply it where and when you want to, uh, with discipline, it has a lot more chance of helping you be agile. And finally, this reach row. Um, how many people write unit tests for your XML configuration files that read them in and see if they're correct and you know whatever? How many people write unit tests for wire protocols? Not, not transmission of data on the wire, but the wire protocol itself. So these are things that you could do. And again, it's expensive, right? You could, unit, you could absolutely write example things that exercise every single thing in your system. Right? Um, but with spec, 
you have this sort of generic toolkit in hand that you can use everywhere. Spec validation can be used as a development time tool, as a test time tool, as a runtime tool, as a production tool. Questions? Yes, in the back. How, how does the spec relate to program verification? That's, a, that's kind of the tail end of a lot of the type systems and things like that for verifying the program's not going to fail in certain ways, things like that. Right, so spec is not really uh, in the same ball game as program verification at all. And, um, and, and that's based on a couple of observations or that, that decision is based on a couple of observations. One, uh, program verification is hard and expensive. And two, um, it often proves that your program complies with this other thing, which doesn't actually establish that it does what you want it to do in the real world at all. I mean, verification is probably better than, than a lot of what people do with static typing, but it's subject to the same problem at the end of the day, which is that you know, you have, <laughs> you're holding this mirror up to your system and saying, you know, you know, wrong over here and wrong over there, happy. <laughs> So it still continues to be a challenge. But spec is not really about program verification. And, and it's worth saying, by the way, that you know, I think spec's really cool, but there's nothing telling anybody not to try and use all of these things and mix and match um, and add another column to this table for program verification and you know, ask you know, how it fits in. Right? These, you know, uh, certainly it is true to closures principles that you ought to have a set of simple tools that you can choose which ones you use and when you want to use them. So uh, spec has a set of different um, features that address some questions that you might have uh, when you're approaching a program. You walk up to a program and you say, what are the building blocks? What, are the, what is the data? This is kind of the motivating case for things like pneumatic schema. Uh, and spec gives you um, declarative structural specifications. So it can say that um, a user account has a primary email address and a first name and a last name and a whatever, those kinds of things. Um, you might also want to know what invariants hold about your data. So spec also lets you uh, make predicative statements. So saying that you know, the email address has to match this regular expression. Or saying that this field over here has to be equal to the sum of this over here. And this is, one, this is where you start to get to things that are, would be more difficult to say with a type system. Right? Because these are, these are dynamic and emergent things that come out of your system when you're using it um, and are difficult to model statically. Uh, how do you check things? Well, spec allows you to make an ad hoc call to validate anytime you want. And validate will return a data structure telling you um, what's wrong. It's called an explanation. So an explanation is a data, not a, not a human readable string, although you can do that too. An explanation is a data structure that says what went wrong and where it went wrong. And once we start using this in the closure ecosystem, that explanation, right, it's going to take you I'm just, I've been picking a number, so I'm going to stick with it. It's going to take you two hours to learn how to read spec errors and understand how they work. And that leverage is going to pay you back. It's generic, right? That leverage is going to pay you back for the rest of your life. And we're going to add specs to more things. You're going to add specs to things. And then whenever anybody hits a problem in the closure ecosystem, that's going to be the most fam It's not familiar right now, right? It's subject to the same criticisms as a lot of other things that Clojure has done in the past, right? Well, that doesn't look familiar. It must be wrong. Right? It's not familiar, um, but once you understand how to read an explanation, you're going to be able to go quickly to where a problem is occurring. And I'll just go ahead and say one thing right now, that the most common mistake that people make when approaching these sort of telemetry uh, type things that are helping you find a problem is being intimidated when the telemetry is large. Right? So you have a spec error that has a data structure that has 500 things in it. And your immediate reaction is, well, that's a lot. That's five. Then that's kind of scary. Uh, but that information, it bears an exact relationship to another thing that people complain about in the closure ecosystem, which is that stack trace is really long. Right? That's the stack trace. Right? It is what it is. It's what your system did. And throwing away part of it is crazy. Now, it absolutely makes sense to have tools that help you navigate it. So if you have a big data structure describing a problem, you could have a tool that knows how to walk up to that and help you. It doesn't have to be a human that says where in these 500 things is the thing that you want to look for. But that's completely orthogonal to the information you deliver in the first place. And this is a super important idea. And when spec was first announced, it kind of devolved into a little bit of an unfortunate conversation on the mailing list where people were saying, you know, uh, essentially, the sky is falling 
because there's not a lot, there's a lot of information here and it's not packaged up really well at the edge for consumption for specific scenarios. Well, packaging it up really well at the edge is absolutely a worthwhile goal and it's completely orthogonal to getting the right information uh, underneath to begin with. Um, also, uh, getting the information right underneath to begin with is a job that has to get done once. Right? It has to be what closure does. Right? Here's spec, here's how we're going to describe these errors. It has to have all the information of what happened that anybody might want. Uh, the interpretation of that, programmatic, not just human, can happen a number of times. Right? People can write, there could be a whole ecosystem of libraries that are, you know, I have the coolest library for interpreting spec errors in this context and telling you what they mean. And so, so rather than sort of uh, pitting interpretation and information against each other, we should embrace having a lot of information and then go out and interpret it and build systems that help interpret it. Uh, specs add to documentation. Specs will tell you not just what went wrong, but what went right. So this is kind of a cool thing that doesn't immediately occur to you when you think about uh, a library for validating data. But if you have a complicated data structure, which could be valid in more than one way, then it's cool to know in what way it's valid. And once you have that nested and recursive, it becomes very powerful. Right? Because if there are seven choices here, and four choices here, and six choices there, and you have that combinatorial explosion of choices, having spec be able to say to you, well, this conforms because this is this, and that is that, and that's the other thing. Uh, in data, right? something that you can consume programmatically, not just as a message, is valuable separately from telling you what went wrong. It's like telling you what went right. right? This data is good, and here's why. Um, spec can generate examples for you. It can instrument functions and enforce invariants uh, on the arguments. It can generate example data and exercise your programs. Um, and it can provide an assertion facility, which is something that you can turn on and then at compile time strip out. So it's like the traditional assertion that people have in Java. Um, but instead of being sort of a general single predicate, you know, predicate and string error message, is kind of what assertion gives you, it gives you all the power of spec. All right. So there's slides here that talk about how to use Clojure. I'm just going to presume that we know how to use Clojure, it being a Clojure meetup, and skip on past those. Any questions? You guys are pretty quiet. Yes? Um, this is like kind of a best practices question. Um, so I was using spec recently to basically um, with some like, like microservices to enforce like the wire protocols between them and the messages coming. And basically the thing I ran into pretty quickly was a, compared to what I've been doing before, it was awesome for being able to just quickly fail and have the service you know, not work if the thing didn't conform. My issue was, and this actually hit something you touched earlier, the specs I had, they feel sort of non, they, they very quickly start to feel a little bit non-declarative, um, just because of the fact that you have some arbitrary programming power and what you can do with the predicates. And I guess I was just wondering, like it, it like feels the natural thing would be to okay, once you've made this spec for this service to sort of expose it somewhere, be able to transfer it, say, this is what this service is. How do you guys handle that in practice that it just felt a little bit sort of like I was passing around code rather than having like, you know, what I'd be more used to in like a declarative structure? So, so the question is, I'll just state it back and make yeah. sure I've got it. Uh, the question is, you know, um, what do I do when I feel like I'm falling off a ledge from declarative structure into writing a yeah, program? That, yeah. um, uh, you know, I'm going to tout that as an advantage, which is it's a continuum that you get to choose based on your uh, decades of expertise, you know, where you want to land. But I do want to point out one important thing to consider in all of that, and that is there are exactly zero problems in computer science, and that problem is getting cardinality wrong. And the cardinality, <laughs> the cardinality that I'm talking about here is the cardinality of the relationships between specs and data you could choose to spec the same data multiple times. So you could choose to say, you know what, at this boundary on the wire protocol, I want something that's really declarative and it's portable, so I'll spec it. And then, in some other context, I want to spec the same thing a different way. Right? There's, there's not a law that says you have to have one spec for a piece of data. You can have more than one okay. uh, and, and use it contextually. So I think that, I think that gives you, you know, an opportunity. Uh, and it's another example of sort of, I mean, contrast that to what it would be like <coughs> to like, use Java types to solve a problem. It's like, well, you have to pick something. And once you pick something with the Java type system, that level of specificity flows around everywhere. Everybody is locked into the same specificity, whether they want to be or not. Whether they'd like to be a little bit more vague, whether they'd like to be a little bit more specific, they're all locked in. Here you get to make that choice. Now, admittedly, 
This is a system for mature programmers because it's giving you a white canvas. It's a much wider canvas than static typing because you have these choices in front of you. And so, you know, uh, I'm not going to say, you know, exactly what's good or bad in your situation, but I'm going to say that, that you're going to have a wider set of choices and you're going to have to live with your choices. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and I would be cautious about being overspecified. And spec has features in it that are designed to <laughs> encourage not being overspecified, and we're still going to screw it up. It's, it's a challenging thing, right, to not overspecify. Other questions? There was another question here. Yes? Uh, uh, thanks for saying that specking it multiple times is reasonable, because I thought about that and wondered about that. And it seems like maybe it's extra work, but it might, might pay off. But that was not my question. Um, do you expect or do you find that you uh, conform a value to a spec and then write your algorithm to the conformed value, or do you just validate it and then use the value normally in your algorithm? All right, so this question is jumping a little bit ahead of things that other people may not have seen, but I will answer because it it's important. And as we come back to conform, we can just talk about this again. But so, so conform tells you how your data matches. So it returns an enriched data structure. Right? You pass in a data structure. And, and the most obvious example is when you have something that's syntax, that's order-based. Right? You pass in something that's syntactic, that's order-based, and you get back something that's labeled. Right? That says, oh, the name of it was this, the arguments were this. You know, whatever. And, the, and your question is, well, if I have that power, do I want to use the conformed thing, which is richer, and program against that? Which, of course, obliges you to conform. Yeah. Right now, now conform is not something you can pull back out because you actually have used it. And you, you're now depending on it for your next step. And I would say that from a performance perspective, if you have to break things apart and label them and give them names anyway, spec is going to outperform hand rolled stuff. Yeah. Right. It's it's good. It's uh, it's been it's been through one round of optimization so far. That round of optimization uh, put it neck and neck with the other sort of spec libraries in the closure ecosystem. Uh, and uh, you know we understand the physics of programs and we will continue to optimize. Um, but it's like I mean, you could obviously hand roll something that's exactly specific to your scenario and get something a little bit faster. But that's the classic like. You know, performance versus flexibility argument. So I would not worry about it from a performance perspective. Um, the other thing that's going to happen, though, I think, is that there will be more features, there will be more things in spec that have a sort of knob on conformance. So some, so some things would say, well, when I conform this, I want it to enrich the data structure. And other things will say, I'm, I'm specking kind of the same thing, but don't enrich the data structure as much. Because there have already been you know, cases where people needed that. And I don't know where that's going to end up landing, but I think that some of that stuff's going to happen. Yes, in the back. Um, I guess this is a philosophy question. It seems like spec really is about you buying into the whole idea of the specs for your data and the testing around that data, giving you some semblance of safety and repeatability versus what you could do by running your system multiple times with random data or user data and the agility that that already gives you, right? With the REPL or whatever. Because if you have to stop and write specs, you have to buy into that mindset that that tooling and that approach gains you more than just running the system through larger sets of data. Is that is that an accurate representation in a sense? I think that's pretty much wholesale wrong. Okay. So, so the, the objective of spec is, is not to force you to buy a load of stuff, right? You can pick zero to n rows off of this table and use whichever ones you want. Okay. And, and, and in fact, uh, variants of what you've said have been spread in the ecosystem already as sort of active disinformation. Like, oh, I'd love to use spec, but I don't want to have, I don't want to do the generative testing. Well, it's the whole point of a simple no. thing. Right, use spec, don't use a generative testing. I have systems where I felt like it was not in my interest to try to go back and spec an existing thing. But, and here's, here, is a, here is a, in my opinion, awesome use case for spec. You pick up a library that you haven't touched in five <coughs> years. It wasn't spec, spec didn't exist then. And you identify three key places in that program that data is flowing through it, and you have no freaking idea what the data is. Right, because you're looking at the, you know, you're looking at super. This is the specificity problem. You're looking at this super generic map manipulation, zip map, reduce, blah blah blah. And you're like, I, you know, and what do we do? 
prior to spec when you see that? Well, you add a print line at the top of those three functions and print out the data, and you run it a couple of times, and you try to see what's going on. Instead of doing that, guess what the data is, write a spec, and instrument those functions, and then run the program, and it will immediately fail. Right? You just guess wrong deliberately. It will immediately fail and give you an error message. And tune the spec, and you can do, you can, and again, this gets back to how rigorous do you want to be? Well, how rigorous do you want to be? You can be, a tiny, you can be a tiny bit rigorous, or you could be ridiculously rigorous. And, and I have found that to make, I mean, I don't like approaching legacy closure code. I like it better than approaching legacy code in other languages, but I think that spec is the missing piece for making approaching, like, and whether people used it or not, right? Because if you didn't use it, and I'm trying to figure out your code, I'm going to use it. Um, and, and I have to read, um, on the Datomic support side, I end up reading a lot of really complicated closure code where, where, people, where people say, you know, I think this might be a bug or a problem with Datomic. And I say, well, can you give me a small example of the problem? <laughs> and, they, and they come back with a thing. Well, we wrote our own ORM, and then we ran it through this thing. And the thing has 41 library dependencies, and this and that and the other thing. And I'm just like, Ugh. So, so I think spec is, is exactly the opposite of what you just said. It's by whichever part you want and by different parts in different contexts. And um, I've had systems that I did no generative testing on whatsoever that I wrote specs for and instrumented a few key functions while I ran my test suite. And uh, usually I discover more about my lack of knowledge of the system than I do about the system being broken. But that's super valuable too, because if I'm working on that system, my lack of knowledge is about to cause me to do something terrible. Right? So, so imagine a function that you know 95% of the time it gets called with this keys in the map, and the other 5% of the time it gets called with those keys in the map, and you're sort of not expecting that. You Maybe. should do a video that shows how you do that instrumentation, because like, that, that's like a, a great strategy. I think. I, think, I think you're right, and this is definitely something, um, I mean, there, there's no doubt that pulling this all together um, it's a lot, you know, simple is awesome, but having, you know, we used to have 48 building blocks and now we have 54 in the most recent release of Clojure. Keeping four, 50, I don't know if you made those numbers up, but keeping 54 things floating around in your head is still challenging, right? And saying, you know, what's, what's the right thing, you know, to use in this context? And I'm not saying that, uh, you know, I try, to, I try to come up with strategies in my own work that localize the consequences of my stupidity, right? I don't exactly understand this, but how can I make my non-understanding of this not extend farther than this boundary, <laughs> so that so that when I do something, I'm not going to you know cascadingly cause harm to others. Thanks. Sure. Okay. So we have structural predicates. So structural predicates include things like primitives. So any any predicate enclosure will become a spec when you use it in a spec context. So internally, spec has a thing called spec eyes. And you know any any predicate, and this is an important idea because what this means is that you already have a vocabulary for spec, right? There's not a separate, parallel thing that you have to learn to do spec. The existing predicates act as specs, and this already starts to cover a lot of territory that would be difficult to do with a type system, right? Because it covers things like primitives and classes, but it also covers cross-cutting things, right? Things that emerge after you committed to classes. Right, you got class A and class B and class C, and you want to say, I want to say something is one of those things, but there's no superclass for it. Right? Well, predicates don't care. Predicates don't need superclasses. So you can have things like nil or rat. Well, nil's not that interesting. Or rational is a good one. Right? Rational. There's a bunch of different underlying types that are logically rational, and so that predicate can match them. And these can be arbitrary predicates. So they can be predicates that match specific values. Um, sets automatically act as specs when you specize them. And again, you can just pass them around as sets. So that's 0, 1, and 2. Right? That set says 0, 1, and 2 match this. You can do value ranges. Um, you can do arbitrary runtime facts. Your own predicates become specs as well, with the caveat of you know, where do we end up? Like, you know, If you write a spec and you want to send it to someone else, they're going to need to code too. So you know, limiting yourself to a certain vocabulary has benefits if you're talking over wires. There are specs that describe collections. So you can say, I have a collection of string. That's a homogeneous collection. You can also specify the kind of the collection. You can specify the count of things in the collection. You can specify whether or not there are repeating elements. Um, the tuple spec. S, by the way, is the idiomatic prefix for the spec namespace. So 
Programs, all my programs now start with require closure.spec as S. Yes? Can you say a, a collection of a record type? So there is not a spec predicate that matches records right now. There certainly could be. Uh, the, the desire has been to treat records as information. So to spec them as maps and not make their type a thing that we spec on. But um, we might eventually do that, and we certainly can't stop you from doing that if you really want to. Um, um, one of the things I like, I mean, I've made the counter argument. I've talked about being in an agile development setting where you use maps early on the, in your project lifecycle and eventually you switch them to records because there's some leverage there, but all your programs continue to work because that doesn't really matter. And I would hate to use spec to make that matter. So, so what you do there, just you know, keep that in mind. Okay, um, so a tuple spec uh, specifies heter heterogeneous tuples. So I want to have a collection of three things, int, int, keyword. And then, of course, all of these collection things compose a nest. Everything in spec composes a nest. So you could have a map of collections of int. This is a map of keywords to collection of int, and then that collection could be nested, and so on and so forth, uh, ad infinitum. <coughs> Specs also allow Boolean logic. So it, they have and and or forms. So the and form says all of these specs must match this thing before I'm happy. So this says this thing has to be a string, and it has to start, to with, start with SKU hyphen. Right, which represents what it means to be a SKU, say, in my database. And the second spec here says that we can identify people in our system in one of two ways. They have a, everyone gets their own unique positive integer, mine's 42. Uh, and they also have an email address. And there are places in our system where you can pass around one or the other of those. So we're going to have an OR spec that says you could be this or you could be that. Now, specs are first class, which means they're just things. They don't have to have names. And in fact, you'll notice that none of the things I've showed you so far have been given names. But there is a database of specs in a run and closure program, and you can put things in that database with the sdef form. So sdef takes a namespace qualified keyword and then a spec, and now other people can refer to that spec by name. Namespace qualified keyword is super important, right? Do the right thing. Use your company name, use the standard, you know. You don't have to put com or org in front of things anymore. I think we're past that. But use your company name or your organization name uh, as the prefix and then you know, whatever else you want. And those uh, specs are now something that if you ship them to someone else, their system can now benefit from them. And what chance do they have that you're going to collide with them? Zero. Close to zero, right? I mean, as long as people are not doing bad things, like pretending to be organizations that they're not, uh, you know, and what have you. And the important thing about these name specs is once you have a name spec, you can start referring to it. So my SKU is a string that starts with SKU. My purchaser has an account ID, which is an int or an email. And an import line item is a tuple that includes both a purchaser. So notice you use a lot of this double colon, which is namespace qualify in the current namespace. That's a shorthand. So double colon purchaser refers to uh, purchaser in this namespace, double colon SKU refers to SKU in this namespace, which apparently was my.app when I wrote the sample code. Uh, and so import line item gets to refer back to those other specs. The evaluation of spec um, aspires to be exactly as lazy and eager as you want it. So it's lazy in the sense that there's all kinds of places where you can refer to specs that don't exist yet, and that's okay, so you don't get sort of tied in circular reference knots. Uh, but then where you actually have to use them, they have to be available. And then they are eagerly loaded and eagerly chased. So you don't have the performance hit when you're validating of navigating through the names. They get compiled down uh, into something that's fast when you actually use them. Specs can also be used to specify syntax. Uh, syntax comes from the word syntaxis, which means arranging in order. And you have syntax primarily in closure in macros. Right? Macros are the way that closure itself and you as a closure user add new syntax to closure. And macros are order-based. So you want to have a way to say, to pick apart something in a macro and name all the pieces. So if I say defin foo vector x plus x1, right? we can name all those pieces. Defin is a function name, and, or defin is the function defining form, and foo is the name, and vector x is the arg list, and um, plus x1 is the body. Right? When you're picking those things apart, and picking them apart and giving them names, is super awesome because what happens in closure with an unguarded macro when you use it wrong? Hilarity. Right? How many people have found ways to get macros to make things that would never compile or run? 
just by, by you know, coming up with inputs that, that are you know, hokey. So you know, the, the being able to spec syntax was one of, the original, one of the major original motivators in spec. Not the only one, but certainly a big one. And the way you spec syntax, well, we already know how to do that. Regular expressions. Regular expressions describe syntax. And they describe that. They describe order. So catenation is order, right? A followed by B followed by C. They describe choices. This could be an A or a B. That's called alt. They describe optionality. And optionality is described with exactly the same keyword you'd see in like a Perl regular expression. Right? Question mark is optional. Plus is repetition. Star is optional repetition. Now, these are regular expressions <laughs> not against characters, but against arbitrary closure forms, which means that the power of regular expressions I'm describing here composes into the whole rest of the system, which is just crazy. Uh, when you think about it. And I actually have to say that I did not realize that regular expressions were not about strings. Right? Even when you read academic textbooks, they often talk about them. It's not just Pearl's fault. right? Academic <laughs> textbooks, too, talk about them as if they were just strings of characters. But they could be strings of anything. And so these regular expressions are regular expressions about anything. So there's defin syntax. right? That's definism is, well, let's say it's a macro. We don't really care. But defin is a form. And you can spec it by saying, well, a defin is a catenation of a name, which is a symbol, a doc string, which is an optional string, because you don't always have a doc string, metadata, which is a map, and notice that there is no metadata here. And then, because it's a function, it can have um, body or bodies. In this case, we have one function body, but the function could have multiple bodies. So that is itself its own name spec, which I'm not showing here, but just to give you the idea. Also, notice that this demonstrates the ability to choose how precise you want to be. <coughs> is S uh, question mark map the most precise thing we could say about metadata? No, there are pretty precise rules about what can go in metadata, right? So we could be more precise here. I'm not saying that this is the most precise thing. And this is the great thing about spec, right? You don't have to be you know, completely nailed down. Certainly when specking something, uh, you know, I, would, I, I don't want to reject a valid thing, especially in the syntax helper. Right? This is helping you write programs by telling you, you know, when you get deaf and syntax wrong. You can also spec maps. So there's a form called keys, S keys. And S keys has in it required and optional. Required says these keys are required. Optional says these keys are optional. Notice that the keys inside the map are namespaced. So spec is designed to create a world where we start passing around in our maps, not in our old programs. Don't break old programs for no reason. Please. But when you write new programs, think hard about using namespaced keywords. And the reason that this is so powerful is that once you do this, then we can share specs with each other. And if you have a little wayward piece of data that flows over into my system, that, and that I can tell that it came from you, because it has this keyword in it, and I can run it against a spec and see what's wrong with it. So there's huge community-wide leverage to starting to use namespace keys and maps. And this explains, if it didn't uh, already seem self-explanatory, why Clojure 1.9 has uh, new uh, terser syntax for namespace qualified keys and maps. I don't know if people have seen this already, where if you have a map that has six name case, namespace qualified keys that are all the same namespace, the namespace qualifier gets lifted outside the map uh, in the print syntax. And that's because we're going to live in a world where we do a lot more of this. Um, you can also spec functions. What is a function at the end of the day? A function is something that takes arguments, and arguments come in order. So what are we going to use for that? Regular expressions, and functions have a return value. So here, I'm going to show a couple of example uses of a function enclosure, index of. And then I'm going to say, let's spec the args to index of. Well, index of takes a source, which is a string, pirate in the examples. It takes what we're searching for, which is an alternative, could be a string, like rat or care, like R. And then it takes what position in the search string are we going to start with, which is, in this case, optional. Right? We're going to start at a position 10 in the second invocation, but the first invocation, we're not invoking anything. And so that from is optional natural int. And then the return value of spec. So this is just a data specification. right? It's just sdef that I've given a name just so I can split it out. And then fdef specs functions. So fdef allows you to say, that function my index of takes arguments, which conform to that spec, and it has a return value, which conforms to a different spec, in this case, nillable natural int. 
All right, everybody take a deep breath in. Out. Now, here's where the crazy happens. Specs for functions allow you to spec not just the arguments and the return value, but the semantics of the function. The semantics of a function are predicates that cover the args and the return value. You put them under a key called fun for fun semantics. And this says, well, a my index of can either succeed or fail, which I'm allowed to give names. So OR forms allow you to give names to things. So I'm going to say, well, it can either succeed or fail. If it fails, not found, then the return had better be nil. And if it succeeds, then the return had better be less than or equal to the size of the source argument that was passed in. Right? So we can reach into the return value of the function, or we can reach into the args. So this fun spec is a spec of a map that has ret and args in it. So you could say, I can reach in and say, what properties have to hold? This gets perilously close to being tempted to write a function, to write a spec like this, and see if you could write a program. <laughs> if William Byrd was here right now, see if you could write a program <laughs> that, given this, could guess what program <laughs> would conform to this spec, and then you don't have to write the program anymore. <laughs> We're not quite there yet. But this is incredibly powerful. Um, and is strictly more powerful than what you'll be able to do with types. Right, types, will never, types can do some of this, but they'll never be able to do all of this. So we've written some specs. They're sitting on our system. They have nice, strong global names. Are they doing any of these things? Nope. They're just sitting there. They're not telling you what you have to do. They're not telling you. They're not telling you you have to give up on running a bunch of hand-generated examples. Or I mean, a great thing is if you can capture examples from past use, and, and you either use that again or generate variants from it. Specs are not telling you what to do. They are just sitting there quietly waiting for you decide, to decide what to do. So what might you do? Well, let's look at some of the execution time helps. Valid is super easy. Valid takes a spec and a piece of information and returns a Boolean. So exciting. True if the information matches the spec, and false if it doesn't. Now, this is separate from all the more advanced things that spec can do, because this allows performance optimizations. These performance optimizations are generally not in place yet in spec, but they, they can be in the future. And this is, if there's a faster way to check if you're valid than to tell what's wrong, then there may be contexts where you don't actually want to know what's wrong. You just want the fastest check you can get. This is what you want to call. You can also ask for an explanation. So when you ask for an explanation, you're going to get back a string like in three, the value oops fails the predicate keyword. That human string, that English string, I could care less about how that's formed. Um, and in fact, I think since we first shipped it, you can now rebind the function that makes that string. The underlying data is what matters to me. The underlying data, when you call explain, you get call explain data, is a map that says, uh, what path were you on? If you were inside of a bigger spec, how far had you gotten? Um, what predicate failed? In this case, the keyword predicate failed. What value caused it to fail? Well, the string oops wasn't a keyword. Right? A and B and C were keywords, but oops wasn't. Um, and then N says, at what position in the data structure did this go wrong? Well, 0, 1, 2, 3. Right? This is where people's eyes glaze over, and they say, well, this is kind of verbose. Tough. Right? This is the information about what went wrong. It's generic. It's arbitrarily nestable. And by the way, you're going to love it when your IDE uses this to go navigate through the data structure and put red circles around the problems in your data, which you need this kind of information to be able to do. People should be calling Colin right now and telling him that this is the next thing that uh, yeah. cursive needs. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Conformance is the flip side of explanation. This tells you how your data was right. So here I'm conforming the args to defin. And I'm going to get back a path that says, what are the names of things in the spec that matched? So each one of those path elements, b's is short for bodies, the arity one body, the args, the args of that should have a symbol, which is your name. If you go and look at the spec, which is a complicated spec, that represents a path through the spec where there was an option at each choice. right? There was an or or an alt. 
that was named. Now, I'm not necessarily defending those names. In particular, when I look at this one, I wonder why args, like I have to go read the spec to see why you have args of args, why that happens twice. But this idea is powerful and important, and it is you can get a path through how you matched a set of alternatives uh, in a spec. At dev time, specs enhance your doc strings and they let you generate samples. So here, I'm going to define a spec letter grade. Letter grade is a function that takes as its arguments a grade, which is a numeric grade, and it's going to return a letter grade. These are the letter grades that were in fashion when I was in school, A, B, C, D, F. I know that they've been changed now to like, you know, participated a lot, or participated some, <laughs> participated some more. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But anyway, whatever. <clears throat> um, and then when I do a spec like that, I'm going to get in the doc string the spec. Um, obviously, having these specs is going to change how we write doc strings, because there's stuff that you had to say in the doc string you're probably not going to bother to say anymore. You're going to focus more on, on on things that are English explanations of things that you can't capture this way. Also, with the spec, you can exercise a spec and generate data. So, given a spec here, I'm specifying the grade is an integer in the range of 0 to 100. And then I ask Clojure to exercise grade for me. Right? Take grade out and walk it around the neighborhood. And I'm asking for 25 values. And I'll get back 25 values. Why do these values come back as tuples? Because the first thing in the tuple is generated data that matches the spec. And the second item in the tuple is the conformed value. Now, in the case of integers, the conformed value doesn't have any additional information. right? Because there were no alternatives or ors. So there were no predicates that add new labels or anything like that. But if this were more complicated, then the first and the second value in those pairs would be different. You can also ask uh, closure to exercise a function. So you can say, given a function letter grade, exercise it 25 times for me. Now you're going to get the input as the first argument and the result of calling the function as the second argument. This is incredibly valuable at development time because whenever I, mean, I can't tell you how many times already this has caused me to go, oh. I forgot to think of what happens when there's zero of them. Or I forgot to think of what happens when it's really big. Or I forgot to think what happens when this other choice, you know, when this combination of choices happening. And just being able to look at this, right? Who does the job of making up examples when you're writing unit tests? We do. Right? And we have we have some advantages over random generation and some disadvantages. <laughs> now, let's make programs robust. You can turn on instrumentation for a function. So, and, and this is nice too because I'm going to imagine in this particular scenario that I'm not going to bother to read the doc string. I'm just going to guess how start server works. So this is in that this is that scenario where I'm you know working on some legacy code. I don't even know how start server works. I don't trust doc strings anyway. I'm going to call test instrument on start server. <laughs> that is going to install in start server a spec enforcing thing at the function call boundary that's going to verify that the argument list match spec. I'm then going to call it with host, local host, and port default. I thought that that was a good way to call it. Turns out I'm wrong. I'm not supposed to say port default. I'm supposed to say port followed by a number. And then I'm going to get back an extremely verbose but precise pointer to what went wrong. I'm going to be told at position 0 port, the value default fails to be a port. It fails because it's not a positive int. <laughs> The arguments to the function that were called were host, local, host, port, default. So I have the full original context of where the problem went wrong. The failure happened in instrument. So we'll see that there's other test features later that have other sources of failure. And the problem caller is this file, this line number, inside the scope of this var. I want this all the time when I'm writing programs. I mean, how many times have you picked up a closure library? This happened to me just the other day. I was trying to figure out. XML and zippers in Clojure. And I found this cool blog post that talked about it. But there were four different libraries that you had to add. And I didn't grab the same versions of the libraries uh, that had been used when we were at the blog post. And you know, I made a function call and hilarity. right? Just bad things happened. I couldn't tell what they were. And it's like, I really wish I had something that said, well, over here, you called this function wrong. And then you can do generative testing. So you can say, given a function that's been spec'd, check it. And oh, by the way, the check returns really a lot of information. And then there is a helper function already in there called summarize results, which boils that down. Um, the only thing I want to point out, well, well, a couple things. One, testing for free. Right? It's going to generate inputs. 
run your code, verify that the thing matches the output. That's pretty awesome. But the second thing I want to point out is that because this uses test check to do this work uh, under the hood, you get shrinking. So what shrinking is, is given an input and an output that represent a failure, can we find an input that would be easier for a human to understand? And our minds are limited in the cardinality of things we want to consider at once. So the, I, generally, shrinking is a heuristic of, well, I made a collection with 74 things in it, and the output was wrong. Could I make a collection with 73 things in it and have the output be wrong? Oh, I can. Maybe I could think of them with 72. And so shrinking tries to find a smaller input. And you can see here that it found, in this case, a ridiculously tiny input. Right? It found that an empty string and a string with a single character in it uh, as the two arguments were sufficient. It had made something bigger than that originally, which we could call out. I left out uh, some of the output here. You could see the original bigger failure as well. But you want to see the small failure. You know, Most of the time, the small failure is a big help. And then we have assertion. So assertion is like um, validation, but throwing an exception if the thing's invalid. And you can turn it on or off programmatically. Um, it has two levels of being able to be turned on and off programmatically. There is um, all the way on, and then there's off but could be turned on again. So that means there's still a, an inexpensive Boolean check in the code. And then there's all the way off. So it's like compiled out and couldn't be turned back on. So if you're like concerned about performance and want to compile it all the way out. So it has sort of all the sort of uh, variety of knobs that you would want. So that spec is pretty sweet. Yes? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure that I want that, but... It's like for these functions, I, would, I want to be sure. Uh, I mean, I think the idea, the, the idea with assertion generally, because it, had, it is used in conjunction with all these other things, there's, you know, there are boundaries in your system that you're going to want to conform on in, and in production. right? You're going to call conform. So one of the things, I'm not sure if we'll end up adding something like this, but one of the things that I end up writing, <laughs> I add to every project I start on right now, is, is I, I, I'm calling it conform bang. So it's like conform, but it throws an exception if the thing is bad. And I end up strapping that on at a bunch of boundaries. Uh, this is for, uh, I don't know that I want that. I mean, we can talk about it, but I think that you know, if you're turning on assertions, I want them all. And remember that this plays a little bit with the, the point before about you can have more than one spec for a thing. You can have low cost specs that you assert against, and you can have higher cost, I mean, if you're concerned about even the performance of them in dev, you can have higher cost specs that you use you know, in other places. Right. It is true that instrument you can turn on and off a symbol at a time. So that is on and off a symbol at a time, but assertion is not. Well, an assertion is not, assertions are not nameable, right? They don't have names. Like they could be down in the middle of things, so I don't even know how you would talk about them to do that. I mean, where would you put the flag? Well, the runtime assert thing is still dynamic, so if you really, really want it, you can bind it to true in that context. Yeah, I mean, you could do some sort of, sort of binding around. Yeah. The, you know, compilation or something like that, but you wouldn't be, they, they don't have names, unlike, unlike instruments. So there's not, a, there's not an obvious target. And uh, you know, things that you bind are always like a little squirrely. It's always action at a distance. So there's, there's a trade-off in complexity in doing that. Yes? I want to follow up on conform banks. That's actually pretty close to something, uh, yeah, another question I wanted to ask, which is when you're using that, are you using that almost the same way people used to use, like maybe like pre-post assertions? in a function where you just like at some point in the code you're like I want to make sure this works and if it doesn't even in like production I want to see what like went wrong and get that printed out. I think assertions is more like pre and post and okay. conform bang is more like product is I want to leave that in, in my production code. That's, yeah, that's actually more what that's actually more what I meant. So like yeah. you just leave it in the production if something goes wrong at any point like with some data you never anticipated it gets in <coughs> you can just have that there and be like this is what happens. Well, I guess if, for instance in Datomic's new peer server um, uh, it validates, it doesn't validate everything it could, but it validates some things um, that are at, H I mean, it's an HTTP server, right? So you know that you already have the overhead of going through an HTTP hop to come to another machine. So I'm not worried about uh, the cost of a spec yeah. in, in the overall of that. And so those things are validated with specs. And uh, we got feedback in the Datomic course yesterday that some of those error messages 
are already better than the hand-tuned ones we made for some other cases. Yeah, no, I actually had this situation a lot where that trade-off is in favor of like, okay, let me just like catch this stuff in production. And so would you, for conform bang, you would essentially run conform, catch the error if it's there, and then maybe run explain and throw it as an error? That's exactly it? what it is. Okay, sweet. Are you yeah. guys thinking of just putting that in the library at some point, or should I just write it every time? Uh, I, I think some, I mean, I don't know. I think something like that should go in, yeah. but okay, for now, we'll see. Write it. Yes? You, you uh, instrumented a function, and you kind of labeled two, two branches of output, found, not found, for that index hash. Uh, and there's a way to call, that reminds me of like an option type, and uh, in the type language, like, there was like not found of nil, or found of index. Is there, and then you, you mentioned that there's a way to look at the conformed inputs. Is there a way to look at the conformed output? Sure. It's, so you could, you could have it tagged with that, like, <clears throat> I found four, and, so, so when you're when you're using uh, like when you're doing generative <laughs> testing, those are the the fun that comes back. Mm -hmm. Those are conformed. Okay. So you're getting back the conformed things. Okay. Um, I suspect we end up. I suspect there are going to be several places where we have places where you want both conformed and unconformed options of things. So I think that's a place that where things will may expand a little bit and have more capability. That is not there yet. Yes. Do you have any recommendations on multiple generators for? You mentioned having specs of various power, yep. generators of various power, where to put them and how to use them. So it's certainly the case that there are some kinds of specs that you don't necessarily want to ship with generators. Like if you're specking a wire protocol for other people to use, um, it, it kind of feels dirty for that to not just be a pure description and having generators with it. On the other hand, you can certainly imagine the argument that if you made a good set of generators for it and somebody else was trying to conform with it, they might want to generate data uh, as well, so so I think that's an area where we're going to have to gain some experience, uh, you know, to decide what to do. And and I'm not going to kid you, writing generators is like some canny business, right? You get generators for free, and that's great. But so so let's imagine that you tell spec to generate um, uh, a pair of things. The first one of which is a number, and the second one of which is a boolean. I mean, you can just use random generators to make that. But now imagine that you're telling it to generate something that the first thing is a number and the second thing is a boolean that's true if the first number is odd. Well that's still okay because what's going to happen is about half the numbers are going to be odd and the generator will automatically retry until something is valid. Now imagine an arbitrarily complicated predicate relating those two things. Right? <coughs> um, if you have a complicated predicate such that the domain of one of the values uh, most of the values in that domain are not going to lead to valid values in the related value, then you're going to have to help the generator. You're going to have to say, how do I programmatically construct, how would I construct a thing that matches this? Which, by the way, is actually the real problem. Right? So it's not, it's not you know, it, it's, it, it, when you first hit it, it's like, wow, this is an unexpected difficulty. But it's actually the computer science of the problem. Right? You don't have, you know, given a, given a predicate, we don't know how to write an arbitrary program that makes things that meet it. If we did, um, encryption would be in big trouble. <laughs> yes? Can you talk a bit about conformers and how you see them being used? I think they're, I think they're cool, but I'm not sure where they fit. Like, do you see a lot of conformance going on, like conformers? So, it just so conform, not, not the conforming, like you mean the actual conformer function? Yeah, that can, will coerce a value to something that works. <laughs> yeah, I think conformers are evil and you should avoid them. Okay. And we should, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's, it's hiding some of the information that spec gives you. And so there are, you know, I, I would be very cautious about, about doing that and ask yourself, you know, is there another way to accomplish uh, what I want to do? Um, and in particular, when you make those work, you end up wanting to make them work in the opposite direction as well so that they, they can generate and everything. So I, yeah, I have, I've avoided using them entirely. So I actually am not, <laughs> I don't have relevant experience to offer. Yeah, I was thinking about maybe like, because in an HTML form, everything's a string input. So having conformers there makes a little bit of sense because you can just conform, use the conformer to convert what you type into the input string to what the value should be. But I couldn't really think of another. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things there, I mean, we start talking about coercing values. I wouldn't use conformers to coerce values. It's really about having things that, that the picked apart thing doesn't add information. And so that extra pathing that gets added by spec is something that you don't want. I think when you want to start coercing, you should write a separate library that does coercions that leverages spec. I mean, spec's not in the business of coercing values. Okay. And I think, I think it would be abusing conformers to do that. 
Also, when you talk about being at the edges of systems, here's another, here's another point. So I've spec several things where the actual edge is a JSON thing. And so I spec the post conversion thing. So the first thing I do is I have some sort of JSON to Eden reader, and then I spec the red thing. Um, there are some trade-offs there, right? If that value doesn't conform, the error message is now not in terms of the thing the person originally made. But otherwise, you have to do, you have to put up, you know, you have to spec all the ugliness of JSON and talk about it at that level, and I'm just not going to do it. So it's sort of your punishment, right? If you if you have to send me JSON, um, I'm going to turn it into something better and tell you what's wrong with the better thing, and you'll have to figure <laughs> out from there. Sorry. Uh, is there any work to actually uh, remove the work of writing specs where you know you have a good set of data, or perhaps at the edge of a system you're getting something like an Avro schema, and you already have those defined, and there's a single source of truth, and you could just generate it at the broadest sense, perhaps just type information, uh, uh, what's it called, specs for those? Yes, uh, but not by me. Okay. So, so I'm aware of a couple of different people who are working on projects that are taking other sources of truth and emitting specs <coughs> based on them. And it's super interesting work. It's also a really interesting way to teach yourself about specification generally by trying to make two systems map to each other, because it will become really evident where weaknesses and choices have been made in, in each system. Uh, one of the things that spec is not about, um, and this is you know true throughout the way Clojure works, is that we're never about objects or relations. And so what you're going to find in some of these wire protocol things is they find they have a way to talk about references, right. and and saying you know well this is a reference to this thing over here, and we're giving it a name and stuff. Spec doesn't do that at all. So, and so regular expression uh, components or whatever, but does not have the recursion. So there is there are recursive specs and there are you can there are places where you can have recursive specs that's fine but there's not um, there's not the notion of specking and talking about identity right? specs okay. don't talk about identity they talk about values and and it's about information uh, likewise you know I would be really leery of using predicates to spec like we we went down sort of briefly um, specking what comes off of a channel right I mean the problem with that is the act of checking the spec is side effecting right it pulls the thing off the channel. So that's not a real, I mean, that kind of thing requires more careful consideration. So I wouldn't jump into something like that. Yes? On the uh, topic of multiple sources of truth, is there any plans for any kind of interop between datomic schema and spec? Uh, that will definitely happen. Uh, it remains to be seen how quickly it will happen. It's driven a little bit by uh, how <coughs> entangled spec is with 1.9 and how quickly the ecosystem moves to 1.9. So, I mean, in my happiest world, spec in 1.9 would be shipped already, and, and everybody in the Datomic ecosystem would say, we really want to be on 1.9, and then the answer would be, yeah, we can do that. I will say that the, re the release of Datomic that came out yesterday is 1.9 on the server side, right? It's not 1.9 on the peer side, because that's your code. I can't, we can't tell you what to put there, but that does mean that you could write transaction functions that had specs in them and things like that. Um, if you're if you're one nine on your peer, then the transactor should be happy with that. But I don't know how quickly the rest of that will move because it, there's you know moving parts. In that tuple generator that you showed, um, I noticed that for the range that you specified, it generated two lower bound pairs, but it never quite reached the upper bound. Um, and with my testing of spec, I've noticed that it tends to prioritize the lower bound. Right. Um, what do you recommend so that you make sure you get all the boundary cases of whatever you're specking? So there's two things. One of the things is that um, spec leverages test check, and test check has that bias, and so that's why. Um, but a lot of check systems have that bias because that has proven effective at, at finding bugs. The thing you need to do is just make sure you run long enough to make it let it make big values. Because if you run, the thing is, if you run the generator ten times for ten iterations, you won't get as big of values as if you run it one time for hundred iterations. Because those generators are stateful, and they know as you run them longer, they want to make bigger and bigger values. So run your generator for longer, or if you're really dissatisfied with it, write a custom generator. And remember that you can plug that in pretty low. right? You could replace the generators for core things, and then that, all your other stuff higher than that would use that. Yes? One of the cool things, kind of pulling off this other generation question, one of the cool things about type inference, um, about types is type inference. Do you see spec? In that sense, like the type inference where I can maybe give it a few literal values and build up a whole bunch of logic, and then at the end, to determine in my IDE or my <coughs> compile time, 
what result values I get. Um, do you see <coughs> spec contributing any sort of uh, developer help like that? I haven't thought about it, but you could certainly imagine how it could. So uh, I think it'll be interesting to explore. I mean, I think this is. I mean, this is a very general purpose thing. So we're gonna, you know, um, the the coolest thing about it is going to be figuring out what you do with, it, seeing what you do with it. I, <laughs> I mean, I've already been amazed at some of the stuff that people have uh, come up with, and and you know, using it in ways that that are just kind of mind blowing. Yes. Can you have uh, circular references with specs that perhaps use alts and yes. obviously finish? Yes. I mean, I mean, there may be there may be edges in there that have to be sorted out, but in general. This is what I meant when I was talking earlier about um, the resolution of names is as lazy and eager as you want it to be. It's lazy enough so that you can put off doing things and make things like that, and it's eager enough that when it needs stuff, it has it. And it's not um, doing navigation at, say, validation time through <coughs> specs, because that would be slow. Yes? Could you give a few more examples of the mind-blowing stuff that people have been doing? <laughs> So uh, I know somebody who is trying to bridge Swagger and Spec, which I think would be pretty interesting. Um, and I know people who are using Specs to try to talk about the AWS APIs, which are huge and really sprawling all over the place. So I think that is, uh, is a pretty interesting um, use case. Um, uh, I think Karen Meyer, at, uh, my colleague at Cognitech, has done a little bit of playing around with that. Like, given a Spec, could you? Organically grow a program that matched it, right? So, so that you know, I think there's all kinds of stuff out there that, that people are doing. It's gonna be fun. You mentioned that taking off of a channel might not be a good place to use a spec. Are there any other types of problem spaces that you think of that are not good uses for specs? Well, I mean, certainly, certainly anything that's not information, you know, anything that that has side effecty or or I.O. or things like that. Not to say that spec is not a big help there. So the talk I'm going to give at Conch tomorrow, um, which I'm going to go write tonight, uh, is about, I've written the code, is the talk <laughs> needs to still be, the talk needs to be finalized, is, is about uh, uh, an ETL job. And so the ETL job is, is covered with I.O. And, and edges, that things that you don't spec, but then there are also you know, interstices in between those that you do spec. So you can have specs to talk about, you know, uh, different steps in the process. The other thing I would say that's interesting that it took us a little while to figure out is that when you are writing, you might choose in your test suite to write a function that you spec and you end up not specking a function. So we, we had some stuff where the function in our application was side effecty. And so to spec it and generatively test it, you'd have to have specs that pull things off channels and things like that. But you could write a function that then consumes that thing and is not side effecting anymore because it stands outside of it and it runs the whole thing to completion. And then you can have a spec about that that's information to information. And now you're using FDEF not in your application but in your test suite, which at first glance seems a little bit weird because why do you care if that function works? Nobody else is ever going to run it. <laughs> uh, but that function gets you out of the business, right? Gets you back to data to data. So you can talk in terms of spec. So that's something that maybe is not immediately obvious. It was not obvious to me for sure. It almost seems like spec is the, the purity of code as data, data as code in a sense. Yeah, I think that's right. And it, it really tries to, you know, hew to uh, closure philosophy. One thing I didn't say that's important that probably should be uh, borne down on is I talked about the fact that maps have these keyword, uh, namespace qualified keyword keys. Um, what this means is that you don't have um, complected specs. So when you describe something, you describe something only in terms of its first level dependencies, then those dependencies describe themselves. Which is why having a database of names, part of why having a database of named things is important, because you don't want to have a lot of specification systems do all the work in nesting. And now, I mean, that's not, that doesn't really make sense, right? That the nested thing is what it is, even outside of the nested context. It doesn't make sense to have it be described down at that level. And, and that is a formula for redundancy and repetition, because that nested thing is going to appear in another context and have to be spec'd again, and those specs have to be kept true to each other. It's all the same problems that you have, like storing information redundantly in a document store, right? Where it's you know over on this branch over here, it's over on that branch over there, and you have to keep it uh, synced up. Or have your private meta that you want to use somewhere else later? Yep. 
Yes. Can you spec uh, anonymous functions? Yes, you can spec anonymous function. You can test um, all, all the, everything is first class, so every all that stuff should work. I don't have the syntax right on my fingertips, but yeah, you can you can um, create a function spec with I think it's f spec um, that's not on a def, and you can apply that and generate and the whole nine yards. And if that's not the case, that's a bug and will be fixed. But but certainly the the, the basics of that. You know the underpinnings. Um, you know, have gone through a couple of iterations and should be close to right. Yes, the back. So the, the spec registration. There's only a singleton of that, basically. That is correct. There's a singleton of that, and that's because specs themselves are namespace, and we have plenty of namespaces. So you don't have to uh, have another spec. The one place, one place where that does come up though is sometimes people want to make specs that are dependent on the state of an object, which you can do, right? And then you can make your own registry of those that was somehow align with your object. I mean, an obvious place for that is a database, right? right? A spec that, that enforces rules about a database. Um, that's cool and interesting, and it's another example of something you do with spec, but the spec registry is not going to help you there. You're going to have to make your own thing. Okay. Thanks. Yep. You mentioned uh, wireline protocols and uh, I, the scenario where identity and references uh, uh, spec may not, uh, it'll have issues dealing with that directly, any ways around it, or um, how would you use pieces of spec to help test wireline protocols and, and references coming across like that? Well, I mean, you could still you could still use spec to describe the data. You could say the references have these shapes, right? It's just a matter of, of do you want to get into resolving through those references. I mean, you could try to write that, and you're going to hit all the same complexities that, you know, cause us to use things like JSON and not use things like SOAP. Okay. So, I mean, I, uh, uh, I would be very careful and going down that road because really smart people have gone down that road and done horrible things Un unwittingly usually yes what about validation within some context validating a value is valid because it works in this context or not so are you talking primarily about the fact that the global namespace doesn't really make sense because it doesn't know about that context no and like giving a spec and validate it the spec and a context and a value and if it's valid like so you could kind of in your predicates, look at the context to see if like a, an ID is a, one that exists in the database or something like that. So I don't think that you need another primitive to do that. I mean, you could do that uh, with anonymous specs, right? You can make an you can make a spec. Don't put it in the spec database. That depends on some closes over some piece of state and does whatever you want. So so I I would be, I mean, maybe something will end up happening there feature wise, but I would be. It feels like a feature that's not needed. That that, that it's covered by the the built in primitives enclosure that you could do what you want to do. Okay. That doesn't need a special thing. But but happy to be proven wrong by you know examples. Yes, the match. Mentioned how in two two dependent pieces of data and different um, structures, let's say, and depend on each other um, for their value change and monitoring. Is that something you would only want to check it at compile time and turn off later? Or could you leave the spec in place and running all the time as, as kind of a, a you know, conditional check that's almost a monitoring in a sense? So I think that that's a, that is a um, context dependent thing that depends on the cost of the spec and how often the thing changes and how expensive it is to check it. So I don't think there's a, a one size fit all, fits all answer. But I think that people will have things in their system that are stateful and changing and that they'll use specs to guard those changes for sure uh, and you know and, and watch those things um, and all, as always you know, when we're building systems on immutable and accumulate only kind of foundations um, you always have the choice of you know uh, uh, validate early or you know proofread later right you could you could accept a bunch of data in the name of performance get it all in and then you can go back and look at it with spec later and say yep yeah, you know I told you I was going to do that but I see you don't really qualify, so I'm kicking you to the curb. What is the what is the overhead of spec relative to that? Like for a simple case, is it can you only partially load some of the spec libraries that for those particular things? Is it smart enough to figure out that kind of thing and optimize? Or? It's getting smarter. It's currently competitive with all the other efforts that have been made in the closure ecosystem for specking stuff and um, we'll keep it that way cool. so uh, you know um, 
it's as fast as a general purpose thing can be, or that, that's, its, that's its trajectory, and, uh, and it should be the thing that you use. Now, having said that, uh, you know, anything that's in the test namespace, you shouldn't use in production. So that's like instrument, right? Turning on instrumentation is a recipe for making slow systems. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the guiding principles in Clojure is to not have the default stuff you do every day for production be kind of slow. And this is why you know, people ask questions like, you know, why is this particular algorithm not allowed with this data structure? Because if it was loud, people would use it, and then it would be in the bottom in some loop, and it would make programs slow by default, and we don't want that. So a similar argument applies, and that's, that is the, the precise boundary of what's in the closure spec namespace versus the closure spec test namespace. Stuff that's in the test namespace uh, should not be used in production. Um, it, you know, it can be quite expensive, and you know, that's what we have test systems for. Also, you're probably going to want, when you start instrumenting, you're probably going to want, well, you know, we'll see, right? When there's a ton of specs out there, when you have 15 libraries that you're depending on and they all have specs of varying costs, you're probably not going to want to instrument all of them all the time in dev either, right? There'll be, there'll be some choices um, that you make. I'm already writing my code not to turn on Clojure's core specs, even though there aren't any yet, but I'm writing it to walk my own namespaces and turn on those specs at least as the default when I'm developing. Um, um, obviously, you can you know, turn this up and down as you need to. Yes? Uh, one more. <laughs> can you have dependent specs and generate data all the way through the uh, spec hierarchy? <coughs> so you have like uh, exercise, right? Which would generate the data. But you have a, a spec that's dependent upon another one, and that bottom level one doesn't know about another spec. Can you generate data that's valid throughout the whole hierarchy? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Uh, so you would have, uh, let's say, are you saying that you're saying that you might have? So let me give you a, a let me give describe a different scenario. Let's imagine that you have a a spec that describes some data, and in a particular scenario, down this branch, there's another spec that describes that more precisely, and you want to be able to say, does the thing conform? To both this and that, but those things weren't written together. Uh, I guess uh, I'm kind of phrasing it wrong. Maybe, oh, I'm, I may not understand my own question, but uh, <laughs> I guess your data is a spec. Your data is a spec. Right. So your spec takes a spec, and uh, uh, that spec could be any range <coughs> of data, right? That could be generated, perhaps. Uh, so it'd be like a database constraint? I mean, I think you could do, I mean, anything, but I'm not right. sure if I understand your question. So let's say uh, you, have a, you have some dependence on, on this example, the spec says, I could take um, these three values and they have to be uh, set unique, right? And the first value has to be a string, the second one a character, and the third one a odd number, right? Right. And that's a spec. And then uh, there's a, another spec that depends on that spec saying... Yeah, first, and. That's what and is for. S and. Spec, another spec. And then they both have to be true. Okay, they both have to be true. And uh, But that top one that you defined could also obviously have that same and, right? I mean, any number of... I mean, you could have any number of ands, and you could you sort of combine these together. Where it gets more complicated is when you want to make statements that are not at the top level of some other spec. So right. then you find yourself having to speak redundantly, right, in order to work your way. Like, like that other spec would have already navigated down in there. So we've talked about doing things that are, that are pathy. So you can say, this is true, and I want, to over, I want to say additional things about this path in the spec. But there's not a feature for that yet, but I imagine that there will be. Um, likewise, there's merge. So you can have uh, map specs and say, this thing has to match this map spec and that map spec by merging. Uh, merge is better than and in that case because it uh, it knows that they're both maps and so the spec can do more for you. Uh, but once you have that, you also want tree merge, so it can it can sort of chase nesting and do things for you. So there there is some stuff there, um, but it's all possible and you know we're just working our way down the. Almost like you want to use core logic to do some constraint. <laughs> well, I mean you always you always still have that too, yeah. right? So it's not you know, these things are not um, they're not sort of uh, ruling out other things. All right, we should break so we can go eat food because I'm hungry. <laughs> so my name's Stuart Holloway. I'm happy to talk to people. I'll be giving a talk tomorrow. I hope you come.
It's going to be showing some spec stuff. Are you going to have this on GitHub? Right? This stuff is already on GitHub. There's a wiki, which is um, Stuart Holloway presentations. I'll, I'll tweet the link. Uh, but all of my presentations are, uh, are on GitHub in PDF form. And when there's video, I try to link that too. Um, so yeah, you can grab this. Also, this a shorter form of this was recorded at Strange Loop, and this has been recorded tonight and will appear somewhere. <laughs> Thank you, Steve.